Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Amanda, and I'm coming to you live from the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. And we're excited that you decided to join us as we explore the deep sea and bioluminescence. So let's go ahead and give you a number to call. You'll see a number that'll pop up on the bottom here, but you'll also have the opportunity, if you're watching this at a later time and you have any questions, you're welcome to email us at live at lbaop.org, or you can text us in right now as we're doing this program live. Any questions that you have that we can answer live for you to 562-286-1838. Uh, we would love to hear from you. So. If you are younger though, parents make sure, or children make sure that you have your parents in, um, what am I, permission, permission to uh, text us before you uh, do that as text messaging rates may apply. Okay, so right behind me, I have an image of our tropical reef exhibit here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. It's our largest habitat here, about 350,000 gallons of salt water and lots and lots of fish. And right now it almost looks like it could be the deep dark sea, except you will notice that there's some sunlight coming in. So you might see a lot of fish in the shadows, but notice there is sunlight. Now, most of the animals that we're familiar with live in the very top layer of the ocean. If you think about the ocean, the ocean has layers to it and they do it based on light. So the top 200 meters of the ocean is what we call the photic zone or the epipelagic zone. It's that top layer. If you think about your epidermis, your epidermis is your skin. It's the outer layer covering your body. Well, this is the area of the ocean we're most familiar with because it's closest to us and we see it a lot. And it's a lot easier to see because the light gets through it. But once you go below those 200 meters where there isn't light getting through, life starts to change. And so what I want you to do is think about how we would explore an area like that. Think about how do we explore? Because the ocean is pretty big and there's a lot of ocean all over our planet. Most of our planet is covered with water. But when you think about the earth, you see land and then you see water. So think about a globe for a second. If you look at the colors on a globe, say you just have two colors, green representing the land and blue representing the ocean. You're going to see a lot more blue than you do land, the green. But keeping in mind that as you look at the ocean, you're not just talking about the surface of the ocean. Whereas land, you're kind of looking at the surface of land. If we go out exploring over land, we're pretty much looking at the surface of it. But when you explore the ocean, you're going not just at the surface, but down below. And think about just how deep that is. Now, if any of you know, you, if any of you have interest in this, you might already know what the deepest part of the ocean is. In fact, I will tell you the deepest part of the ocean is in the Pacific Ocean. So there are oceans around the world, all generally connected. You might think of them being separated by land masses, but if you look carefully, you'll see that all of that water is connected somehow. And so in all of the whole entire world's ocean, it happens to be the Pacific Ocean where we have the deepest part. And it's called the Mariana Trench. And the deepest part of the Mariana Trench is what's called the Challenger Deep. Now, if you think about the ocean, again, in general terms, and you think about what we're familiar with, what we know, the average ocean depth is about two miles deep. Now, two miles, well, you might think, well, that's not that deep. But I want you to imagine, you probably have had to run a mile at school before. So imagine running, instead of around a track, a mile, running straight down into the ocean, one mile deep, and then adding another one, two miles. Now that's just the average ocean depth. So obviously it's shallower in some areas, but a lot deeper in others. And so when you're looking at the deepest part of the ocean, it's gonna be hard to get there. Obviously we can't just run down there. So I want you to think about how do we explore the ocean? And you're welcome to text us um, any questions and any comments and thoughts you have about this to 562-286-1838. So behind me, I have some images. And these are not images um, taken at nighttime of some place on land. This is down in the ocean. But what kinds of things do you notice about this? How would you describe this habitat? Hmm. Well, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of life down here, does it? Do you think the ocean at the deepest part just doesn't have any life? Is it just, what are these things anyway? 
not a lot of color. I wonder why that is. Well, what kinds of things do you know about the deep sea? And thinking about, we said that the light doesn't get through because below 200 meters, you're missing out on the different wavelengths of light. Now, let's talk about light a little bit. When you see a rainbow in the sky, we've all, we've all thought about that and we've seen rainbows and we've thought about, well, what is a rainbow? Well, we know that all the light that's shining coming down from the sun is made, it look, what we call white light, and it's made up of different wavelengths of light. And prisms can allow us to take white light and bend it in such a way that you can see the individual waves of these different colors. So you've got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, right? Those are the colors that we can see with our eyes. Now we can see those different colors because they're all different wavelengths. So the longer wavelength of the red light that we see on the top of the rainbow is actually not as strong and doesn't travel as far when it gets to the water. Now the strongest wavelengths are going to be the shorter wavelengths like the violet and the blues. So those colors will travel farther and are more commonly seen in the ocean. So as we go deeper, I don't know, maybe we have, we might be able to pull up some footage later on of what it does look like. And we'll see, does it make sense for animals to be any color at all in the deep sea? Do you think they're all just black? Well, we'll see what we can find out. So I want you to keep your eyes open. If we do come up with some images for you to see, I want you to really keep your eyes open for the colors. Okay, so we know that color travels differently as it goes down into the deep sea. We also know that the deep sea might look different. It might look initially very barren, but this is just one picture. Now, Prudence says, how did the Mariana Trench form? Now, that's a really good question. So when you think about how any land forms, whether it be a mountain or um, a deep trench in the ocean, it has to do with the Earth's tectonic plates. So the Earth is constantly shifting and moving, and these plates are rubbing up against each other. When the plates come together like this, it can create these mountains, uh, mountains on land. There's also mountains, though, in the ocean. We just can't see them because they're covered with water. Now, also plates, when they come together, they can go down and create valleys and trenches and canyons that we're familiar with on land. Well, there's also canyons in the ocean. And so when we're looking at this deep sea trench, it's an area where these plates have kind of moved apart from each other. Now, there's also some interesting things that are sometimes seen along these uh, tectonic plates and where uh, their borders kind of come together or separate. Um, but I want you to take a look at this image right here. Now, this is an image coming from uh, NOAA, which NOAA stands for National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And this is one of the ways that we're exploring the deep sea. What is this? Do you know? Well, this is considered an ROV. Do you know what ROV stands for? It's a remotely operated vehicle. So just like a remote controlled car, that's kind of what this is, but it's under the ocean. Now you might see this big long tether attached to it. So it's got this big long, um, basically cord of, of wires and whatnot that can control it. And think about how you would control what you would want this to look at and what would you want to see? So imagine with me that you're going down to the deep sea. What are the things that you want to discover? What are the things that you want to be able to, to do when you're down there? We know it's going to be very dark, so you're obviously going to need some sort of light. So you can notice this has a light attached to it. But think about the things around. Normally these animals are completely in darkness. And so this is actually a foreign thing for them, right? This bright light coming down, that, which is something that you don't normally see. But we would need to see it uh, for our eyes to tell what's down there. Oh, it's a big um, mount. It's a big rock mount. Um, so we can actually learn more about the bottom of the ocean and um, how the mountains and the canyons form and kind of graph it and map it. In fact, there are many people who are doing that. It's not just by looking at it, but they do it with sound. And there are ships, these research vessels that will go out and they're mapping the bottom of the ocean in areas that people maybe have never been in before, but by using sound, we can learn more about it. But obviously to see it with our own eyes is what we'd love to do. Of course, there's challenges to seeing it with our very own eyes because we can't go that deep. If you've been swimming to the bottom of a pool, you can imagine, um, you probably felt the pressure on your ears as you're diving down deep. 
Well, imagine that pressure as you go a mile deep, because you were probably diving, what, maybe five, eight, 10, 12 feet in a pool. Well, as you go deeper, that pressure is going to increase around you. And so our bodies physically could not handle if we tried to dive to the deepest part of the ocean. We would be crushed underneath the weight of all the pressure around us. But by creating ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, that we can be up on the surface in a boat, we can control this and send it down without a person in it um, and see what's down there. So we would want to have a light that we could see, um, some sort of lens that would allow us to take pictures and videotape and see what's actually down there. And then what if we see something really interesting that we've never seen before um, and we'd like to know what it is or get a sample of it? Well, there are actually arms and grabbers on these ROVs that can collect samples. Uh, so this right here is what an ROV arm would look like. So this is on the ROV called Sebastian. So they actually have names for their ROVs. And this is on the research vessel uh, Felcor. And the Felcor is run by the Ocean, um, the Schmidt Ocean Institute. And they have this ROV that they'll send into the water, but how do you think they control it? Well, if you like to play video games, this might be the thing that really interests you because they control this just like you would operate a video game. So see this arm that's right here? This is what you would find in the control room for someone who's trying to control what that Sebastian arm is doing. And they can move that arm just like that um, arm would be moving on the ROV. So they can literally see and position it how they want when they're looking through the lens of what's in front of the ROV so that they can very delicately handle and manipulate it so they're not injuring anything um, as they uh, take collections or maneuver things around to get a better view of things. So it's really interesting. If you were interested in marine biology and you love videos, video games, and playing video games, you might actually be, um, this might be a good field for you to get into. You might be able to uh, control some ROVs because that is the number one way we are going to be exploring the ocean since we physically can't go down there. Now, hold on. Haven't there been some people who have gone down to the deepest parts of the ocean? And yes, there have been. Uh, so there are some people, there are what we call manned submersibles that can also go down deep into the ocean. But it can take a long time to get down to that uh, depth. It can also be very cold down there. With no light, there's no heat coming from the sun. And so the water gets very, very cold. However, there are some heat sources. We'll get to that later. Now, a manned submersible might be great, but boy, you really have to hold it if you have to go to the bathroom, right? So you have nowhere to go. You're down there. Imagine what that would be like surrounded by darkness um, in this small little container. Uh, people have done it and they have absolutely loved the whole experience and being able to be the first human eyes to see some of the things that have been discovered down there. I'm sure it's fascinating, uh, but it's a lot easier if we can just send down an ROV uh, to look at it uh, without having to put the people in it. So this is Sebastian, you can see the name of it. You, there's the arm that we were looking at earlier. So this is a pretty, pretty large um, mechanical device here about the size of, we say like a car or SUV, um, something, something like that. And then they can send this down to give us a better view into the ocean. Now, Gage also has a question. He said, can lights in the midnight zone help animals camouflage? Oh, Gage, that's a really good question. In fact, that helps me transition into another part of this class is, boy, lights in the midnight zone. How could that help an animal? And wait, where are these lights coming from? Because didn't you say this is an area where the light doesn't travel from the sun? So yes, there are lights that can be found in these deep, dark areas, but, there, but it's not coming from the sun. It's coming from the animals. So what do you call that when an animal can produce its own light and generate its own light? It's not having to plug in, doesn't need electricity. Well, it's bioluminescence. So bio meaning life and luminescence meaning light, right? So this is a creature right here. This is a type of invertebrate, a worm that has bioluminescence. Notice the beautiful blue color. It's actually, I'm not even sure what the name of this particular worm is, but this is a worm that can be found bioluminescing in the ocean. Now it's actually very common for animals in the deep ocean to be bioluminescent. In fact, about 75% of the animals in the ocean have the ability to bioluminesce. And I didn't even realize that that was so common that that many animals could light up in some sort of way. 
Now, keep in mind there's different types of luminescence. So this is what we call bioluminescence, where they're creating their own light. It's usually a blue color. Now, there's also something called fluorescence. Now, fluorescence is not where this animal is creating its own light, but rather it is reflecting back um, this bright color, this usually green, um, when blue light hits it. So when the right type of light hits it, it will glow in this really beautiful kind of eerie color. So this is a, a fluorescent fish is what we would call it. And there's actually other animals that can fluoresce too. Even sharks uh, have been known to have fluorescence on them. Uh, one of the common sharks that a lot of times people will ask questions about uh, or they want to know about when they come and visit the aquarium are cookie cutter sharks. Now cookie cutter sharks have actually, bi or not bioluminescence, fluorescence on the underside of their belly. And they think that one of the things they do is light up to um, distract their predator and, or I'm sorry, to distract their prey so that the prey might come over to check out what is this glowing thing in the deep part of the ocean. And then the cookie cutter shark will swim on up to it and take a piece out of it and take a bite out of it. Uh, so, and actually I should probably double check. It, it's possible it could be bioluminescent. I'm pretty sure it's just fluorescence. So, uh, but when the light is hitting it just right, it has this glowing color. So there are swell sharks are another type of shark that can be found off our coast here locally in Southern California, uh, which also have this ability to fluoresce. And it's actually somewhat relatively new that we've been learning about it. Uh, so there's more animals in the ocean capable of fluorescence than we had even realized. Corals are another example of organisms that will uh, fluoresce as well with the uh, right lighting. And when we open the aquarium again, uh, we have some animals in our exhibits here um, under the right lighting where you can see that fluorescence and they're really, really beautiful. All right, so getting back to Gage's question about can the lights help an animal camouflage? The answer is yes. So the way that these lights would work now, obviously, if it's a dark environment, any sort of light you would think would make something very, very visible. And while that's true, and that can be a really good thing for some animals in the ocean, it can also help them to blend in a little bit better. So if you're down below and this animal is making what they call a vertical migration and it swims up to the surface, um, a lot of times some animals will do this at night. If they have their, what they call photophores on their body, so these little, uh, um, cells basically that will light up, they can kind of match their surroundings a little bit by being a little bit lighter. When the ocean around them is a little bit lighter, they can put on these photophores to help them blend in. And there are some really neat examples that you can find online of fish using photophores to help them almost disappear in the water where you see them. Uh, because when they're lighter, when the background is lighter, it helps them to blend in and kind of gets rid of any of the shadows that they would be creating. So a lot of times on the underside of fish bodies, you might see that lighter color uh, because if anything's below them in the deep sea looking up, it's going to help them to camouflage a little bit better. Now, why are some other things, uh, other reasons that an animal might bioluminesce? Well, one would be to help them to camouflage, maybe hide from predators. Another thing might, might be as like a big example, like, hey, I want you to see this light and I want you to come on over to where I am because I'm hungry and you might be something that I want to eat. So you can probably think of an example of this fish. There is one type of fish that has this bioluminescent ball right on the top of its head, a little lure that it will stick out to attract prey over to it. It's called the angler fish. And the angler fish attracts its prey by using bioluminescence. It's actually bacteria that is glowing inside of it. And as fish see that and they come on closer, then it can just gobble them up in their great big mouths that they have. Uh, and the big fish that you see, the big angler fish, are the females. The males are actually the small ones. Uh, the males sometimes can be found on the side of a female for a time before they get absorbed by her body. Uh, so male and female angler fish are very interesting organisms. So here's a picture of an angler fish right here. And there right there is the lure and this is what will glow and attract fish over to it so it can then eat it up when they get close enough look at those teeth hard to escape something like that so interesting adaptations living in the deep sea because obviously it's going to be hard to find your food so you need to be able to take advantage of whatever opportunities you have now what might be another way that bioluminescence could 
signal a meal? Well, what if you are being eaten by something? Now it's in the deep dark sea, no one can see what's going on, but you've just been lured in and now you're being eaten. Well, one of the things that they've discovered is that animals sometimes use bioluminescence as a burglar alarm. It's like a big signal going out to everyone. Hey, I am being eaten. Are any of you out there hungry? Because there's this big meal right behind me that maybe you'd like to come and eat so I can get away. Uh, and so this is an example right here, these beautiful lights all in a circle. This is an example of a type of jelly. And this is a bioluminescent jelly that has been known to sound off this burglar alarm um, to um, alert other um, would-be predators of what's eating them uh, that there might be a tasty meal around to help the jelly get away. So it's really beautiful when they flash this. So they'll have all these flashing colors. It can also light up here in the center as well, um, but it'll have all these lights just spreading out. Bioluminescence is something that can happen very, very quickly um, in like millions of a second. Um, they can, um, maybe, maybe not millions, but really, really fast. In fractions of a second, they can send this bioluminescence uh, to, even though it doesn't usually last very long, uh, but they can send it out to um, attract uh, prey or predator or even a mate. That's another thing that they'll use their bioluminescence for is by communicating and helping them to find each other. Now it's not just animals in the very deep sea that have bioluminescence. Sometimes they'll come on up to the top and you might even be able to see them from the surface if you go to the beach at night. In fact, just recently here in Southern California, there were reports of glowing waves. I don't know if you've heard of this before, but it is a thing and it's actually created by little tiny plankton in the water called dinoflagellates. And dinoflagellates can create their own bioluminescence that make the water appear to be glowing. In fact, if you were to be in that water and move around, any sort of water movement is going to make the water glow around you as you're disturbing these little tiny, tiny dinoflagellates in the water. Now, dinoflagellates are also what's responsible for what's called red tide. If you've ever been out to the ocean and it looks kind of red, or even a brownish color, it's because there are so many of these dinoflagellates in the water which have a naturally sort of red color. Um, it's also not a time that you want to be in the water swimming because you could get very sick if you were to get any of that water in your mouth because dinoflagellates do have toxins in them that could be very harmful to you and the other filter feeding animals um, and fish that could be eating them in the ocean. So stay away when there's red tide. Uh, but they do make, dinoflagellates can make beautiful um, bioluminescence um, in the waves at night. So if you're ever at the beach at nighttime and you see what looks like glowing waves, it's not just your eyes. There are actually little tiny organisms, dinoflagellates, which are actually a, almost like a plant-like or an animal-like plant in a way um, that can swim. It's like a plant that can propel itself. It's kind of interesting. Okay, so Roxy wants to know how many creatures have you found down there? Okay, how many creatures have been discovered in the deep sea? A lot, but we're still learning. Not as much as there is, let's just say it that way. The ocean is not very explored. They say only about 5% of the ocean has been explored. That's not very much. Remember how deep we said it was? And so there's a lot to still be discovered um, and uncovered as we explore the deep ocean and we learn more ways that we can do it more efficiently. Um, so there are several different types of fish, corals, and other invertebrate, invertebrates that were just found within the last year. So how are we finding these organisms? Well, we're using research vessels like the Falcor. We're using other um, vessels like the Nautilus. A Nautilus is this research vessel that has cameras all over the boat. So not only can you see what the ROV is seeing, you can even see what it looks like in the control room. You can see what it looks like on the deck as they're getting ready to put the ROV into the water. And this is something you can actually do from home. You can go to uh, Nautilus Live, um, make sure I get this, www.nautiluslive.org, and you can type in any questions. As you're watching them, you can see them on their um, explorations as they are going out and exploring the deep sea. So as they put their ROVs into the water, you can actually control the different cameras that you want to see on your computer at home. And you can see what images that particular uh, camera is, is bringing up. So if you go, this is their website here. So up at the top, photos and videos. 
Um, if you go to watch live right here, you can see what's going on uh, there. Now, normally in the spring and summer is when we would be exploring, uh, but right now their top priority is safety. Uh, but there are some highlights that you can see. So this is actually ooh, a very interesting deep sea animal right there. And this is another thing you're going to find at the bottom of the sea. Do you recognize what this is? Well, it looks like there's gases coming up. This is a seep. There are gases that are being um, released at the floor of the ocean and coming up into the water. And we also mentioned that, that it can be very, very cold down there, but there is something that can warm up the water. And those things that can warm up the water are hydrothermal vents. And what you're looking at here, notice how you see what seems to be coming up here. It looks like smoke right here. These are hydrothermal vents. And there's different kinds of hydrothermal vents. There are some that look like white smoke and some that look like black. And that has to do with the type of minerals or the elements that are coming out um, from this. So this is where hydrothermal vents happen where magma and salt water come together. And so the magma from the Earth's crust is coming on up, from the core of the Earth is coming into this very, very, very cold water. And it's going to create these deposits that create these chimneys right here. And a lot of organisms can be found living in these areas where the water is being warmed a little bit. So normally it's very, very cold. We're talking about, let's see, four degrees centigrade. Um, but this water around these hydrothermal vents can be more than 700 degrees um, Fahrenheit. So it can be very, very hot to write in these areas. But around the coolness, um, it creates a habitat that many different organisms can be found in. Now, let's see. There's also, it looks like there's another question that's coming on in. Uh, and I wish that we could show you some more of the really interesting deep sea animals that live um, in these dark areas. But I don't know. We have, we're kind of limited on what we can, can show. So we'll see what my friend Stacy has, uh, what she can pull up for me. And, but for now, take a look at, ooh, at this image. Oh, oh, this is going to be really cool. Watch carefully. What that, those moving lights that you see are part of an ROV. Ooh. Whoa, what do you guys see? You see those long arms coming? What kind of animal do you think that was? You got it right there, the giant squid. So this is really exciting because for the longest time we have known that giant squid have existed because we've seen them washed up on beaches or we found them in the stomachs of whales. But this was our first video footage that we had of a living, breathing giant squid. And it's really neat that we were able to capture that video and take a look at what this animal looks like when it's still alive. You see how long those arms were in those suction cups? Pretty impressive. Oh, oh yes. So we talked about the bioluminescent plankton, uh, the dinoflagellates that are in the water. There's also another interesting bioluminescent type of plankton, and this is called an ostracod. And ostracods also can spew out little bioluminescence, uh, little bits to maybe distract something or maybe lure something over. Usually bioluminescence is used by, um, by the creatures in basically startling something, by startling them, throwing them off so either they can get away or they can more easily get their prey because it's been distracted. So we actually have a class here at the aquarium where we take these ostracods, they're dried out, but we can actually see how they can produce light. And I'm thinking that we probably have a video of that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna show you, this is what they look like. So really, really tiny. This is in a bowl about this big. But we turned the lights off and then we added, we crushed it up. These were not alive, these were dried. And then we added some water. So look at that. Do you see that blue that's glowing? You can even see some of it that's in the little pipette right here. Some of the water got sucked up into the pipette. So what we did is we just crushed up those dinoflagellates, or not the dinoflagellates, the ostracods, uh, also called sea fireflies. And just like a firefly in the, you know, in the air that you might see on land, uh, they have that same ability to produce bioluminescence. And it's kind of the same way that this animal does, but it's just in the ocean. And so they have something called luciferin inside their bodies. And also in the presence of luciferase, which is an enzyme, 
they can create oxyluciferin and light. So they're producing light from what's already inside their own body with just the addition of water. So they're getting um, the oxygen from the water and creating this bioluminescence um, coming out of their body. So it's neat that we're able to recreate that in the classroom and, and see those glowing, um, the, the glowing light coming from them. Okay, Laura wants to know, do ROVs collect live specimens? And yes, they do collect live specimens. And how do they survive the pressure change? Well, that's actually an inter interesting thing. Um, I don't know exactly what this is a picture of. Okay, okay. Okay, so I'm being told that these are the collection devices, the specimen um, collection for any of the animals that they collect, and they can be pressurized. Now, one thing I think is very interesting is I heard a story about someone who was working really, really hard to create a pressurized environment for some of the deep sea animals that they had found that they wanted to keep on exhibit and display. Well, nothing seemed to be working very well to pressurize um, that container for those animals. So they kind of gave up. They're like, well, I just can't come up with anything. And they just kind of tossed them in a tank. Well, it turns out the animals didn't need the pressure. And they were able to survive without being under that pressure. So even though they're normally under tremendous pressure, most of their bodies are filled with fluid that don't have air spaces in them like ours do. So if we were to go down, it puts more pressure on the solid parts in our bones and all the gas places that we have in our bodies. Um, as we go down and as we come back up. Now, these animals, if their bodies are mostly water, they don't have that same sort of pressure, uh, same sort of pressure problem. And it's kind of interesting that most of the animals we see deep down are invertebrates that don't have backbones, don't have any bones, and mostly water in their system. Uh, oh, and another good example, and I don't know if we have a picture of one, we don't. Um, is the nautilus. So the chambered nautilus is this really cool animal uh, that has this shell. Do I have one here? I don't have one here. Uh, but it has these chambers in it. And the chambered nautilus is basically like a, an octopus. But instead of having eight arms, it has 90. And instead of having suction cups, it has little grooves on its arms. And it can regulate its buoyancy um, by sending gas through these different chambers inside of its circular um, shaped shell that it has to allow it to go up and down in the water. And, oh, I do have an example right here. So if you've seen one of these before, this is from um, a nautilus. And it has um, inside here, if you were to look inside, we have this one cracked open so you can see, it has these different chambers inside the shell and these would be filled with gases that would allow it to control its buoyancy. But okay, uh, Lara also wanted to know, scientists study them at depth with traps or pressurized environments in special aquarium? Well, again, uh, we've learned that it's not always necessary to keep them under pressure. Uh, but maybe you've heard of the blobfish, uh, one of those animals that you're like, oh, it looks really weird. It's got this strange looking face. Uh, but part of that is because of the fact that when they took that animal out of that pressurized environment, it didn't have the same pressures on its body that it normally does at depth. And it did look a little bit misshapen. Uh, so keeping in mind that when we do pull animals out of the, their environment, if they're normally at a different depth, they might look a little bit different than what they normally look like in their natural habitat and environment. And okay, it looks like we are out of time. Uh, but thank you for joining us today. Hopefully you learned a little bit more about the deep sea and bioluminescence. But again, please do um, contact us because I realize we kind of had the opportunity to, maybe we could, there's so many more things we could talk about in the deep sea. So if you have more questions, contact us at live at lbaop.org, and we would be happy to answer your questions and talk to you more about the deep sea and bioluminescence. So thanks again for joining us, and have a great day, everyone. Bye.